Okay, let's get started. Um, I'd like to welcome Scott Morrison from Australia National University. Okay. Yes. And he'll be speaking on Covenant Homology and Covenant Yes. Yeah, so uh, the point of this talk is to tell you a little bit about, well, first of all, Covenant Homology, because I'm not going to assume that everyone, that anyone knows what that is in the first place. And then to try and explain, uh, first of all, that we should expect to be able to extract information uh, from four manifolds using combined chronology, and then to give you a specific proposal on, on how to do this. Uh, let me maybe say by the beginning to avoid getting a hook stuff. Uh, avoid getting a hook stuff. That perhaps this isn't a very good invariant I'm going to describe to you today, in the sense that computing it seems quite hard, and uh, I can't, uh, I can, I can certainly can't prove any results about four manifolds as a result of having this invariant. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that it's um, it's maybe a good start. It's, uh, if this is something that uh, might be useful. Okay. So the point is to define. Variant. I'm going to write as kh with an, with an arrow of the four manifold, which is the vector space value of the So, uh, well, in particular, I mean this is a numerical invariant, it's ranking the vector space, but it's more than that in the sense that uh, different morphisms of, a, of the four manifold will act in these vector spaces. So it's actually a sort of Dorian variant of the map. Okay. Uh, uh, in particular, this is an invariant uh, of a smooth format. Certainly, the definition I'm going to give relies on the smooth structure, and uh, it, uh, it's at least plausible that it, uh, this invariant could detect uh, different smooth structures on the same underlying map. Okay. There's also going to be a relative version. So you give me a four manifold that has boundary and a link sitting in that three manifold boundary, and we're similarly going to give you a, a, a vector space. And it's a, this is a, a, a generalization of Kovana chronology. In the sense that when we look at the four ball, it recovers the usual command form. So at this point, I probably should uh, go back in time a bit and tell you what this gadget here is, because uh, we're going to build all of this, of course. Out of the existing, uh, out of the existing invariant, we have the links called Gravano. Okay, so what is that? Well, it's a categorical non-invariant, meaning that uh, it assigns to uh, to knots and links. Objects in some category, and uh, well, let me, let me say this like this. Um, oh, you can see I'm not actually enough there. Can't draw knots. Okay, there we go. Uh, in particular, to links, it's going to give us, or like this, uh, Gruner squared, right? <laughs> Is double graded vector spaces. And then it's, it's categorical in the sense that there are morphisms between links, and it's going to give us morphisms between vector spaces. So if we have a linking cobordism, there's some surface embedded in uh, four space between the two different links, it's going to give us, uh, give us linear maps. Between the corresponding vector spaces, incoming and outgoing links. Now, uh, we also say that uh, 
categorize the Jones polynomial in the sense that you can recover the Jones polynomial from the gradients on this vector space, a suitable version of the Jones polynomial is a sum over i and j is the indices for the two different gradients of uh, minus 1 for the i, uh, q for j, the dimension of uh, the aggregate piece of the one for the one So how on earth was this edge originally defined? Uh, I guess the canonical dates from uh, 2000 to 99. And the original definition, and essentially all of the subsequent formulations of it, are, are combinatorial in the agreements, in the sense that they start with a link diagram for, for the given link, and then uh, associate something to the given link diagram, and then associate something to randomized theorems, and then associate something to the next level of structure called mirroring links. So we can explain that. The fact that it's combinatorial is both good and bad. I mean, it means that you can explicitly compute it, you can write computer programs. On the other hand, sometimes it's uh, it's much harder to to uh, to do topology and see, see some of the structure. So what do we have? So given a link diagram, the run of homology first of all gives us a chain complex. Of graded vector spaces. And then, given uh, a random master group or a Morse group, so then a Morse group here, what I mean is taking some small part of the diagram that looks like this and uh, replacing it with this or taking some empty patch of the diagram, creating a circle, or, uh, or killing off an unlinked component in the diagram. So, so given any of those things, the run of the associates a chain map, uh, acting on the, well, a chain map between the chain complexes for the initial and final diagrams. But then it also gives us more for a, uh, for a movie move, so uh, a movie move is a sequence of random master moves and Morse moves that uh, corresponds to an identity isotopy of some diagram. In terms of the diagrams, it looks like it's doing something, but if you look at the surface being traced out, it's just the cylinder of the initial tangle. So let me draw, uh, think of a, an easy one to draw quickly. Maybe we could start with a little picture that looks like a crossing. Then we could uh, do a random master one move to get pink in there. Oh, maybe I chose bad. Then we could start sweeping this strand upwards. Strand, then we sweep the other strand behind it using first a random master 2 move, then a random master 3 move to move the strand past this crossing, then another random master 2 move to move it up at the top there, and finally under the random master 1. This is obviously just the idea. Okay. So there's a whole sequence of, of, of moving moves relating to two different sequences of random master and moves that actually give isotopic uh, surfaces, and Kirpano from all the associates. The one from all these associates from Mooney group are homotopy between the two chain maps associated with the two sequences. Okay, and so then of course we can just take the homology of these complexes and we get a doubly graded vector space here, one the internal grading from the graded vector spaces and one the homological grading. And then we get linear maps here. So the point here is that 
Once we've gone all the way over to the right-hand side, we're guaranteed that if you look at two different surfaces, which, uh, or a surface that has two different presentations by Radomeister and Morse moons, that those two different presentations of the same surface are guaranteed to give the same linear map, because those two surfaces will be those two presentations of the surface will be related by moving moons, so the chain maps will be monotopic. So once we take them all, we be giving us identity. So altogether, what that gives us is, for each explicit presentation of the link as a link diagram, we get some particular vector space, and then for an isotopic class of surfaces, an isotopic class of cobordisms between two link diagrams, we get, a, we get a, an explicit linear map. Now, of course, I didn't tell you what the actual construction is for those three arrows, um, and I'm not going to do that. So that's, you'll have to take my word for it. One can do this. So the, yeah. the co borders are maybe between different different things. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, yes, I mean you can you can take moves. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. The most moves allow you to, to change any link you can bring out. Okay. Well, there's a clue already that something is sort of that something four-dimensional is, is going on in all of this, which is just that of course link cobordisms, the surface is embedded in four space. The link's in three space, the cobordism is in three space cross. Now, what I could do to try and get a four manifold in brain is tell you about topological quantum field theory. It's a very general recipe. You're, you're roughly meant to think that it takes an n category with duals for some interpretation of what that means and gives you a, uh, a vector space value invariant of four manifolds. Then you say like this, if you're lucky, in the sense that there are maybe some extra conditions you want to put on here as well. Uh, also a numerical invariant of n plus one manifolds. Okay. So I could try and follow this recipe, and in fact, uh, one can define. Four category using a Gravano homology. Gravano uh, homology. And one can then follow this very general recipe to produce an invariant that I'm trying to tell you about today. Uh, if you do that, if you don't get lucky, uh, this four category you build doesn't have the extra properties you'd want in order to be able to use the, the standard recipe to produce invariants and numerical invariants of five manifolds. You're, you're really limited to this part. But I don't want to follow this general recipe today because, uh, well, it's too complicated. Uh, it takes us too much work to, to explain exactly what this means and establish all the structure. We're going to take a shortcut. And the shortcut uh, <coughs> is via these gadgets that we call the lasagna algorithm. Explain and attempt to justify the name, uh, to try to provide an excuse for the name, maybe. Um, but you really should be thinking that while I do this, while I define those on your algebras and show you how to use them to define the variance, I am just doing a special case of this construction. I, I, I have a very particular type of four category that's particularly simple in some ways, and that lets me give this alternative presentation. But this is really what's going on at the back of, the, at the back of my mind. Okay. So what's a lasagna algebra? Well, uh, so a lasagna algebra, and it's no coincidence that that, um, that I'm giving this talk at a place where where uh, I came to talk to Vaughan. Uh, lasagna algebras 
are in some sense very closely related to the, the planar algebras that, that Moore talks about, but in higher dimensions. So a, a planar algebra. What, what's it? What's it? Maybe let me not say that. Uh, let, let's just go straight to the definition. So a lasagna diagram, first of all. What is it? It, looks, it consists of a full ball, B0, disjoint four balls, Bi to the interior of B0. Maybe let me start drawing a picture. There we go. So here's our B0. Uh, a link Li in the boundary of E4 Bi. Uh, these links can be empty if you like, but some one manifold embedded in that, that three sphere. Okay, so there are some limits. And the surface sigma sitting in the complement of B0 take away the union of the ions, uh, meeting uh, the boundaries transversely in the The surface doesn't meet that boundary, but I mean, if, if there's a link there, then it's, then it's got to be the, the, the links are exactly the boundary of this surface. Okay, oh, I can't spell lasagna. Okay, so the reason why this is called a lasagna algebra is that, a uh, lasagna diagram, is that uh, in, in Vaughan's setup of planar algebras, you have a disk, two disks, with some two disks cut out and some. Uh, some strings joining up these disks. I'll make more than happy by drawing in what number of strings in some of the disks. Um, and these diagrams get called spaghetti and meatball diagrams. Okay? They use a plate, there's some meatballs inside, and spaghetti connecting up the, the balls. And now we've gone up, we've gone up to a sort of we've doubled all the dimensions inside. The ambient ball is four-dimensional instead of two, and the strings here have been replaced by a, 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 a two-dimensional submanifold. And so the spaghetti now becomes lasagna. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so that's a lasagna diagram. <coughs> what is a lasagna algebra? Well, a lasagna algebra is essentially an algebraic object where the operations are indexed by these diagrams. What does it do? Uh, so a vector space. Uh, maybe I should say this a vector space for each three sphere containing a link. So here, I mean, I'm not assuming that this S here is the standard three sphere. I'm, I'm being extremely profligate. I just, for every three sphere, anything abstractly diffeomorphic to the, to the standard three sphere, I want you to give me a vector space. Okay. Because this huge collection of vector spaces indexed by spheres containing a link. And um, for each lasagna diagram, which I'm maybe going to abbreviate just by calling the whole lasagna diagram sigma on the surface. Uh, a linear map. And what's this a linear map from the two? Well, it's a linear map from the tensor product 
over the vector spaces associated to the all of the inner balls to the vector space associated to the outer ball. Okay? So you should now be thinking of this diagram as giving us an operation. If you hand me vectors that sit in this vector space and this vector space, this diagram gives us uh, an element of the vector spaces associated with the RC. So that's all of the, the downer of the lasagna algebra. And what do we need to say? Um, such that uh, the linear map only depends on sigma of the isotopy. <coughs> fixing everything else, in particular fixing the down release, if we just move sigma around in the interior, that's not allowed to change the linear map. And uh, that composition of lasagna diagrams uh, gives compositions of linear maps. So what exactly does this mean? Well, if I do say that lasagna diagram, and then I have some other lasagna diagram whose outer sphere is this sphere containing a hot thing. And after I take that lasagna diagram, which possibly has further smaller embedded balls, I need to be able to paste that in it here, gluing the surfaces together, and that could be some other lasagna diagram now with smaller balls contained in this region. And the linear map for that new thing has to be, well, the linear map you got here for the outer ball, precomposed in the appropriate tensor factor with the linear map associated with the small ball lasagna diagram that I plugged in. So you can, I mean, if you if you like this language, so there's an operand of these lasagna diagrams and a lasagna algebra is just an operand, uh, an algebra over there. Okay, so I now need to show you two different things. First, what on earth one can do with the lasagna algebra to build invariants and format folds, and then uh, how to construct the lasagna algebra, how to construct all of this data, starting from the bottom. Yeah, I mean, these, these, uh, these compositions are only defined uh, if the links match up on those. I mean, they match on the numbers? Yeah, so I want, uh, you can potentially here give me, if you have some fixed sphere and you've got some link and you move it around slightly, I'm happy if you give me different vector spaces for all of those different motions of the link. But of course, I'll have linear maps between all those vector spaces coming from the cylinder diagram that just sort of moves that, that, that asymptotes that link map slightly. And, well, maybe I should add an extra axiom. Um, cylinders. Curator isomers. So if you just have a, a copy of an S3 cross I with a link cross I, that should give you uh, an asymptote between the inner and outer spheres. Yes, yeah, so there's a slightly different, I mean, in planar algebra speak, there would be one vector space for each number of points around the boundary here. But I mean, even more properly than that, I'm going to say, why don't we just have a vector space for every sub, for every finite subset of the boundary here, or in this case, every link embedded in the boundary. Okay, so let's do the first thing first. Forget the runoff homology for a while further. What can you do with one of these Lasagna algebras? Inside that four manifold, 
you cut out some number of discrete balls in the complement of, I mean, you seem to draw a lasagna diagram in the form of so in the complement. You, uh, you draw some surface that meets the outer boundary in the fixed plane and meets the inner balls in, in, uh, in arbitrary things, possibly in a few ones. And further, you label each of these balls you've cut out with an element xi in the vector space that your lasagna algebra associates to, uh, to that gap here. Um, Okay. I mean, this notation is a little bit silly. I don't really mean to span these diagrams. What I really mean is take the, the giant direct sum of all the pictures I've drawn here of the tensor products of the vector spaces associated with those intervals. Okay? And then I take this ridiculous vector space and quotient out by. Uh, by a relation uh, which uh, well, you need a word for it, let's, let's call it enveloping. But what it means is that if you see locally inside this picture some lasagna diagram, sigma. The infinite intervals are labeled with x and y. You can replace all of that picture that you see inside with a single ball labeled by a oh, sigma of x and y. Okay? So you can take any, any, any sub ball of this diagram and cut it out and replace it with the lasagna algebra evaluation of everything that you saw inside. Okay. Now that's the definition. Just show you some vector space. Now, in some sense, it's clearly a ridiculous definition because before we take this question, certainly uh, we're, we're very much infinite dimensional, which could direct some of all embedded surfaces in here. It's, uh, well, at least they're all embedded links. But it turns out that, uh, in some cases at least, once you take this question, you get down to something finite kind of dimensional. And it's not so surprising in the sense that. Uh, you can take you can take most topological quantum field theory invariants and present them in this sort of way. It's a, as a, some very large infinite dimensional vector space, modulus of local relations, and still end up with uh, with finite answers. Okay, so let's uh, postpone for a while discussing uh, our ability to calculate this invariant and return to seeing if we actually have an example of this coming from. So how do we establish all of this data for a common model? Well, the first problem, and a sort of fundamental problem, is that this data we're going to give here uh, is a vector space for each link sitting in a three-sphere. Whereas common homology negatively gives us uh, a vector space associated with linking in the, in the three ball. And there's actually a subtle difference. The point is that if you have uh, um, if you have a link in the in the three sphere and it's isotopic to some other link in the three sphere, then you could delete any given point in the North Pole say, and the two links are still isotopic. That is, you can ensure that the isotopy avoids the North Pole. On the other hand, if you have some cobordism in S3, and that cobordism is isotopic to some other cobordism in S3. When you delete the North Pole, you might you might uh, obstruct that isotopy between the two, two cobordisms. So, sorry, yeah. Why is this an environment for functional? Um, because I made no choices. Uh, I mean, I, uh, there's, there's nothing to prove to show that it's invariant. I, uh, I didn't pick handle decompositions. I didn't pick anything else. I didn't, I didn't add any extra structure to this in order to write this thing. It's just a, a canonically vector space. Yeah. 
Sir. So we need to define the Kovanov homology of a link in a free sphere. And this is what we're going to try and do. We're going to define this uh, to be the flat sections of a certain bundle. That well, the, the base space of this bundle is going to be the complement of the link in this three sphere. And sitting over any point in that base space, we're just going to assign the vector space that Trevon homology happily associates for us to the link sitting inside that pre ball we get, uh, taking away the, the, the point x in the, in the base space. Uh, now, if I'm going to talk about flat sections of a bundle like this, I need to define uh, a parallel transport upstairs for you. In terms of a uh, path in the complement, so the camera wants some path in the complement of the link. Given by an there's a natural equivalism the link cross i sitting inside our sphere cross i take away the graph of gamma. And now uh, this is just some surface uh, with, with um, boundary components, both two copies of L sitting inside some four ball, so to run up a moment, you have to give us a map between a well defined map between the vector spaces upstairs. Okay, now this definition maybe isn't very good without saying a little bit more. For example, are there any flat sections uh, of, of this bundle they defined? And what we can say is that this bundle is flat, i.e., uh, the divide actually non zero flat sections. particular actually uh, evaluation of a section at any point uh, is actually an isomorphism. This one is flat if something in particular holds, well suppose I've got some link that looks like this. It's a tangle T with two boundary points that I've closed up on the rack. And what I want to do is, uh, I'm going to write down some quite complicated um, isotopy of this link. Essentially, all that I'm doing is something quite simple. I'm going to take this spoon here and, and sweep it around T uh, by, by, well, by two pi. So I do a little right amount of one move. I then uh, do something rather complicated. I pull a full span behind, we require a huge sequence of right amounts of two and three moves. And undo the right amount of one root down here, and then I have to do everything again to get back to the right side. Okay. So this is some isotopy from this link to itself. Kavana homology is going to give me some um, uh, some linear map from the homology of this link to itself. And the condition is that that's always here. So if we can see that Corona homology always gives us the identity here, uh, this bundle is flat and taking flat sections is a, is a reasonable thing. Um, essentially, what's the, the proof of this theorem? Well, the point is just that this isotopy I've drawn here uh, is isotopic to the, this, this isotopy is itself isotopic to the identity isotopy if you're in S3 rather than sweeping this string around, you can sort of inflate out through infinity and see that you did nothing. But it's not obviously, it, it's, it's, it's not isotopic to the identity in B3, but we need it to be if we're going to be able to work for combined homology for links in the spheres. Okay, so then the, 
The second theorem, I should have said actually that everything in this talk is joint work with Kevin Walker uh, at uh, Section 2 of the Senate. Uh, the, the second thing is that for Kovanov homology, mod 2, because all these vector spaces that we've been talking about all the way along, all the way along, now have to just be vector spaces over F2, the Kovanov homology mod 2. This also solves. Now, this is a very, very, very sad situation. Um, we don't know if it works otherwise. And um, this is somehow a, a, a particularly sad situation uh, for me personally um, because. You know, my one actually useful contribution to Kravana homology was that the, um, the original definition of Kravana homology only ever worked mod 2 in the first place. And the thing that I did with Kevin Walker and, and David Clark was actually gave a, a fixed version of Kravana homology that, that worked in other characteristic. Uh, I mean, at the, at the Kravana level. And the really sad thing is that even with our fix, uh, we don't know how to, to prove this fact except mod 2. Okay, so we settled for working mod two for the rest of uh, the rest of today. Okay, um, I guess I have to tell you how. Let me just quickly leave that diagram. Uh, quickly modify that into a uh, diagram in a ball. How do I define the? Uh, so it's, um, yep, yep. It's a, you have one of these bundles for each element. Yes. Um, okay. So for each L, I've got some some bundle of Kravana homology vector spaces here, and I'm trying to work out if the bundle is flat, so that it makes sense to define the Kravana homology as the as the flat sections. Now, if you know this is true, for all T's, then for all L's, this was a flat bundle. Yeah, I mean, you could imagine some horrible situation where over the integers you could do this for some links and not others. But, yeah. And the, the, the point here is that we know this is, this is the idea, at least working on two pieces of those. Well, yeah, just say that this is zero of the bundles, not flat, the ones that's Um. You could, but then one thing I can prove about this invariant of four manifolds is that when your four manifold is the four ball, you get the original Kovanov homology back. And I would, I would only be able to say you either get Kovanov homology or zero back. So okay? it could be a pretty lame uh, thing to be able to say about this. So, yeah. I mean, if it doesn't work over the images, it's going to be because of some spin structure business. And it'll be fixable even if it doesn't work over the images. But well, I mean that's not a that's that's a that's a gut feeling, not a, not a, not a Okay, so I need to quickly tell you uh, how you define the now I define the vector spaces for the spheres. I need to tell you how the lasagna diagrams actually act. And essentially, um, you say, well, what what I could do is just in this picture pick a base point on each sphere. Draw some arcs that avoid the surface, but if we're in high enough dimension, we can, we can do that safely. See what Kavana homology can. Now we know what Kavana homology does because this is just a picture of an product in a, in a, in a, in a essentially in a beefy cross R. And then the fact that uh, this thing we defined, this vector space, um, is actually isomorphic to sort of the, the value of the section at any point from the W point. Let's just, let's just say that. Um, the, let's just say that this is a well defined uh, action of, of plus and minus. Okay. I know, uh, and I guess you also need to check that it didn't matter which arts you, which arts you picked here, but it turns out that, uh, that this theorem and the fact that that map is the identity uh, also gives you the proof that uh, it didn't matter which arts you picked. Okay. So let's say a little bit about how on earth we might compute this thing. Uh, in, 
in spirit of this, this is a TQRT invariant. So you expect to be able to find uh, uh, invariants for the lower dimensional manifolds as well. And we can, for three manifold, we can define a, uh, a linear category. Now, if we've got some three manifold sitting in the boundary of the four manifold, this vector space for the four manifold becomes uh, a module over that linear category associated to the piece of the boundary. And moreover, if you see two copies of some three manifolds sitting disjointly in the boundary, this vector space can be given the structure of the binary over that category. And then the, the theorem is that you can uh, you can compute this vector space associated to uh, W. Loop to itself along M, so this is the, just pasting the two copies of M together in the boundary. We can compute that algebraically by taking the vector space associated with the cutover manifold W and computing the self tensor product uh, of, of that binary interaction, just identifying the left and reactions. Okay, so this in principle gives you. Uh, a way to explicitly calculate these vector spaces via, well, I mean, what, what does it mean? I mean, if you have a, say, you pick a handle decomposition of your manifold now, you can think of that as building up a manifold by gluing together a bunch of balls in, in some order. And so if you, if you can identify when you put one handle under the zero handles and the two handles under the zero handle, you know, under the one handles and so on, if you can identify each step what this algebra is and how it's acting on the vector space associated to the, the lower dimensional cells, can calculate this tensor product. Unfortunately, it seems that in all but the very simplest cases, it's very hard to identify what these categories are associated with different manifolds. So, um, so the, the outer limits of things you can calculate using this tool are things like if you look at B3 cross S1. And then uh, Take the uh, sort of, uh, sort of one crossing link in the boundary of B to cross S1. We can, uh, we can tell you the vector space associated to, to something like that. We're essentially you're, you're using this theorem, uh, like cutting up a little bit, identifying the, the category for a three manifold. Is just a disk of two marked points in its boundary crossing the middle links cross, and then uh, and then and you can actually follow through this calculation. Okay, but that's not very satisfying. We'd really like to get to say much more. And the, the really sad thing about this invariant is that the main tool for computing the Gavana homology of links is no longer available. So that, what that main tool is, is the exact triangle for resolutions. So uh, this is just back in, in the role of, of, of links. You have some link, and we're looking at some crossing somewhere. Uh, there's an exact triangle between the, the chain complexes of, of uh, this link with the crossing match as there, the link with that crossing resolved one way, and then the crossing resolved the other way. And in practice, this lets you compute very efficiently the component homologies of, of links, of, of relatively light links. And you should think of this as sort of a, a homological analog of, uh, of the, uh, the scheme relations that let you compute the Jones point. You can compute the Jones point of this thing as a linear combination of the Jones point of these. Now what we see is that the Corona homology for this link 
is some cone between the Kavanaugh phenomenon, the Kavanaugh chain complex for this, and the Kavanaugh chain complex for this. But once we, we're looking at some four manifold, the invariant we've defined there is, uh, I mean, you, you should think of it, it's some gigantic quotient. Okay, we've, we've defined this. Uh, we've defined this huge vector space and then taken some quotient. And the problem is, at the moment you take that quotient, you lose exactness, and this exact triangle fails to hold. And in fact, the whole point of doing this calculation in this case, sorry, no, no matter of substance here. The whole point of doing this calculation was to try and compare uh, the results for this link and this link with the two resolutions. And you can actually see in this case, the exact triangle really does, really does fail. So uh, there's, there's hope, um, and I guess I have two minutes left, is that right? I can stop right on five, yep. So there is something you can do, uh, and so then this very beautiful sort of advertise, uh, without really saying anything about it, there's this gadget called the blog complex, uh, also uh, Kevin Walker. And the whole point of this project, the blog complex, was really to fix this, this problem. The, the point is to uh, replace this usual TQFT construction with uh, something like a derived version of the TQFT construction, where you can hope that, uh, that, that uh, exact triangles that hold locally will also hold on, uh, on average manifolds. And um, I guess uh, I think that it's, yeah, I don't think I can say very much useful in two minutes about the blob complex of like a phenomenon. But essentially, what you do, instead of defining this A of W as some big vector space of diagrams, modulus of some relations, you replace it with a chain complex. Where the first chain group is just this ridiculous vector space of low relations, and then there are higher pieces that, uh, that sort of have the effect of imposing some relations, but then there are also higher pieces all the way up. Go very schematically draw. And H0 of this whole construction is what we were talking about before. Uh, but the exact triangle, well, if, you, if you don't take the molecule of this blob complex, the exact triangle for resolving crossings does hold, and you get a spectral sequence that, uh, that potentially lets you extract information about the Kravana homology of a four manifold group with this link in the boundary uh, in terms of the, well, unfortunately now you need to know all of the higher blob homologies of the Kravana homologies of the four manifold with these links in the boundary. But in principle, at least that's an extra calculation also. <coughs> okay, I think I'll stop here. Thanks. Questions? So, so you know, for playground, you have all kinds of examples, like Manhattan diagrams and yep. you know, all over the show, but some of which may have nothing to do with yep. the policy at all. So, yep. do you have any lasagna? No. Nope. This is my Kamara Kamala case, so awesome. The, it's the only example I know of, of a of a as nice as possible for that. I mean, no, I mean there are so. Uh, I mean you can. Let's see. So you can certainly define. Um, uh, I mean, there are there are, I can tell you lots of constructions that sort of produce any categories from whatever any line. I can sort of specialize some of those constructions and then use more. Give you examples there. Like, I mean, you could just instead take essentially uh, uh, for a lasagna algorithm, you would label the inner balls by maps to a two connected space, and maps all the actual balls to a two connected space, and you can construct a lasagna algebra and things like that. But the only sort of intrinsically four dimensional thing I know that satisfies the nicest possible axiom. Just like four category was on this Kubana. I mean, well, no, I mean, Kubana homology is, is this categorical version of, of the SU2 point of non-invariant. And of course,
course, all the other quantum noise variants have the bottom of the consistency. They should all have a nice properties here. And that would be silly, but that's the only possible thing. Thank you.